All right, and so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Before we dive in with a specific talk today, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our classrooms for joining us live. Uh, I know it's been a crazy eight months for you guys with regards to school, but it's so nice to see kids back in the classroom, socially distanced with masks. You guys all rock, and it's nice to have you back. And for the teachers, thank you guys for having your class join us for their first month back in class. Uh, it really means a lot as we continue to highlight cool scientists, explorers, and amazing places and facilities around the globe. So this month has been all about ocean plastics. All month long, I think we've got 15 programs highlighting that. That's our big theme, really topical, really important, and we love it. But in today's talk, we are diving pretty much as far as you can get from that uh, and going instead to the Royal BC Museum. So. Over the last couple of years, they've been a huge partner of ours. They've shared all sorts of amazing presentations in their galleries. But today we dive in with a topic that I'm particularly fond of with people that I actually had a chance to work with a few years ago too, which is marvelous. So we are gonna learn about dinosaurs at one of the elite research dinosaur facilities in the world. Um, and so nice to uh, be joined by the team there. So without further ado, I'll bring in Liz. Liz, thanks so much for joining us and let's dive in with your, your awesome dinosaurs. Hi, Jesse, thank you. And hello to everybody out there. Um, so my name is Liz Crocker, and I'm an educator on the learning team at the Royal BC Museum. And I'd first like to acknowledge that we, our museum is in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, and we are on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation. So we're just so very glad to be able to work and live and play here. And so I'm excited to be in the paleontology collection room at the Royal BC Museum, and I'm going to uh, flip my camera around and take you in to meet a couple of our paleontologists here at the museum. So hang on. This is a new, uh-oh. Check is half the fun. Jesse, Something you have to, to help me because I'm not getting the commands anymore. That's odd. To change my, oh, change my camera view. Let me try there. Oh, now we got it. There we go. I find smacking the camera often makes it work. Does for me. Satisfying you if it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay. So I'm passing by somebody right now. There's Derek. We're are we gonna <laughs> You can come back to me. I'm gonna come back. This is Derek Larson, the new our newest uh, one of our newest staff members, paleontology collections manager here at the World BC Museum. So he's got some interesting things here, but we're gonna go around the corner to Victoria Arbor's office to start there. Hello, welcome. Come on in. There Come on we in. go. Uh, yeah, welcome to the paleontology collection at Royal BC Museum. We're sitting in my office where I've got some collections things, but we keep most of the collections out in the cabinets at the side, which I'll show off later. But I wanted to invite you in here to show you one of my very favorite fossils at the museum, which is a little dinosaur nicknamed Buster that we named as BC's first unique dinosaur species late last year. Um, so it's coming up on Buster's first naming birthday, I suppose, pretty soon. Um, so Buster is an interesting type of dinosaur called a leptoceratopsid dinosaur, which is probably not a dinosaur most people are familiar with, but they're co cousins of Triceratops. Um, they don't have the big horns that Triceratops has, but they have this kind of parrot-like beak. They got a little shelf on the back of their head. They have a little horn under their cheekbone or under their eye. Um, and they're very little guys, so they're not very big dinosaurs. We don't have a full skeleton for Buster, but we do have enough parts that we were able to tell that it's a new species. The new species name was Ferrosaurus sustadensis. That means the iron lizard from the Sustut River where it was found along a set of railway tracks back in the 1970s. So we've got a couple different parts of Buster. This is Buster's shin bones. Uh, this is the tibia and the fibula. They're still articulated together, which is cool because it means that maybe the specimen was more complete uh, when it was first exposed to the surface and then sort of eroded away over time. Um, but this is really cool. So this is Buster's shin bone. So he wasn't a very big dinosaur. The full bone was maybe about this long so Buster was maybe about the size of like a sheep. Um, so not a huge dinosaur, but not a teeny tiny dinosaur either. So we've got part of the shin bone. We have one of the lower arm bones. This is called the radius. It's one of your lower arm bones, one of these bones in us. So you can see it has pretty small little arm bones compared to the shin bone. So maybe Buster walked around on two legs instead of four. It's a little hard to tell. My favorite bones though are these ones. These are Buster's toes. 
And I really like these because they're still articulating together. So there are three bones here. One, two, three. This is the claw and then two of those sort of knuckle bones. And it's actually the toe bones that help us tell that it was a new species because we could compare the lengths and shapes of the toe bones compared to other closely related species. And we saw that they were a little bit different. So Buster had slightly differently shaped feet than other leptoceratopsids. And that was what helped us name it um, Ferrosaurus instead of some of the other ones that have already been named. So I think these are pretty cool. We've got a couple other toes here, but I like this one that's all articulated. Some of the, that's one of the bigger toes. This is one of the smaller toes. So very tiny little bones and then a tiny little claw. Buster's bones are really cool because they were found a very long time ago in a part of BC that we didn't really know dinosaurs could be preserved in. So it's found in a very Northern part of the province. Actually, I can show you on my map behind me. So we live right down here in Victoria, BC on Vancouver Island. And Buster was found all the way up here, smack dab in the northern middle part of the province, um, along this place called the Sustat River. There aren't really a lot of towns nearby because it's very remote. You can only really get there by sort of a bush plane, so a little plane that lands on a grass airstrip. Um, and so we went and looked for more of Buster, but we couldn't find any more, unfortunately. So, but that's where that's where Buster comes from, right up here. This map might look a little funny to you guys because this is actually a geological map. So this is showing where rocks crop out in the province of different ages and types, um, rather than it being a map that shows like cities and things. That's why it's very colorful and in these sort of interesting stripy patterns. So Buster lived about 67 million years ago. And when we went to look for more of Buster, we didn't find more of the skeleton, but we did find a piece of a fossil turtle. Uh, and we also found lots of fossil plants. So we do have a little bit of an idea of what the environment was like when Buster was alive. Um, elsewhere in North America at that time, that's when you get things like Triceratops and T-Rex, which is pretty cool. So maybe if we keep exploring that northern part of BC, we will find a BC T-Rex or Triceratops one day, which I think would be pretty cool. Or maybe we'll find more new species like Buster. So that's one of my very favorite dinosaurs in this collection, one of my favorite fossils in the whole museum. So I thought I would maybe take us out into part of the paleo collection and show you what it's like to keep and store the fossils here so that people like myself can study them and uh, other people can enjoy viewing them when we put them on display. So we've got all of these metal cabinets. The metal cabinets usually are locked when I've got this one open for today. And this is where we keep all kinds of different specimens. One of the fossils that I think is really cool that we've got up here is most of an Ice Age bison skeleton. And so this is a bigger animal than Buster, for sure, you can tell. These are some of the backbones, the vertebrae. And this is a mostly complete skeleton of a much younger animal that only lived about 12,000 years ago instead of 67 million years ago. So that's pretty cool. So we've got most of the skeleton, it's disarticulated, and we've got it sitting on this nice foam padding so that everything's really well protected and safe. And every specimen in our collection gets a number, um, a unique number that's linked to information in a database. So this is RBCMP 1000 and Buster is RBCMP 900. So I kind of like these two numbers because they're a hundred numbers apart, which I think is pretty cool. So yeah, so all of these drawers in this cabinet just about, or at least these first three drawers are parts of this skeleton. So you can see a big skeleton takes up a lot of space in a collection. I know there's some things with these um, cabinets, Victoria, maybe yeah. you can explain about if we, because we're in a seismic zone, if there was an earthquake, yeah. aren't there some protections with these cabinets? There are some protections. So that's why I usually keep them locked so that the door couldn't pop open and have things come out. We live in it. Yeah. Because we live in this earthquake zone, sometimes we might get a rumble or two and things might wiggle around a bit. So that's why we keep things really well padded. Um, and that's why we tend to keep the doors locked. And these cabinets are also bolted to each other so they can't fall over and tip over quite as easily. So it's something we have to think about. Everyone lives in different places. Some museums live in flood or live, exist in flood zones or maybe where there might be wildfires. So we all have to think of different ways to keep our collection safe while we're here. Let's walk around the corner and see maybe what Derek has to show off. We had a glimpse there. of Derek. Yeah, a glimpse <laughs> of a Derek. <laughs> Derek, what have you got there? There you go. Hello there. So I'm looking at some of the uh, fossils that we have from a very special site uh, called the Maccabee Collection. 
And these fossils, uh, usually when you find a fossil, it, it re represents the hard parts of an animal. So the bones or the shells of an animal that lived uh, millions of years ago. However, uh, at Maccabee, what we've found is that because these fossils were preserved in lake beds, so they were very slow uh, moving waters that were able to preserve very fine details, we get uh, some very cool and unique fossils um, to uh, the BC area. So we've got here, if you look in this drawer, um, you've got things like big fossil leaves that are preserved, but even more interesting, we have things like fossil insects. So this is a fly here that actually preserves in these mudstone rock layers that were put down at the bottom of a lake. So that's definitely one of our, our uh, prized uh, parts of the collection. We have a lot of fossils from this site uh, and we're, we're very excited to be able to see what, uh, what new fossils that we're going to find um, uh, in that collection. Uh, just behind you there, you can see some of the tools that we use. So when you go out and look for fossils, uh, there's a lot of different tools that you have to bring with you, and sometimes they vary depending on what sort of fossil that you're collecting. So it's, of course, always important to have maps because uh, you don't always have, uh, you know, great, uh, great reception where you're going or anything like that. So paper maps are still very useful. This is actually a, a topographic map which shows you actually the elevations of various places as you go through uh, along the edges of a, of a mountain. Uh, but uh, some of the tools that you use for actually digging um, will start with a large pick uh, and our, our tools are sort of scaled. So they're different sizes depending on how close we are to the fossils. So when we need to remove a lot of rock from sort of above a fossil, which we call the overburden. We'll use a pick to dig away large amounts of rock um, well away from the fossils. And as you get closer to the fossils, you'll get smaller and smaller tools. So this is a, a geologic hammer uh, and, and even a little awl like this, and so that you can use that to sort of chip away at the rock around the fossils. There's also somewhat heavier hammers as well, which we would use if the rock is very hard. So this is a, a nice big sort of heavy hammer to do that. We also want to be sure that when we collect fossils that we make sure that we don't lose any information that is associated with the fossils. So this is a very important part of the fossil collection process. So we'll fill out this label and we make sure that this label stays with the fossil as it comes back to the museum. So we give every specimen a number, we identify it, say what it is and, and what species it belongs to, uh, the information like the GPS information about where it comes from, the elevation, how high it is, the name of the location, as well as the, the rock formation, who collected it, when, and any comments that we might have. And all of this information stays with the fossil and is an important part of collecting um, the information and doing the science on the fossils themselves. When it comes time to bring them out of the field, we'll often use something like this. This is actually a plaster bandage. It's dry, but if we put some water in this, it becomes basically a small bandage that we can use to wrap up the fossils and keep them safe and protected in a hard coating, kind of like the cast for a broken arm. Um, but we, we use this to make our what we call field jackets to collect the fossils and bring them back here to the museum. Yeah, so those are some of the tools that we use um yeah okay thanks for that what else have we got thanks, here what else or, should we, we got or should here? we move to a few questions or there's all kinds of interesting things <laughs> on the window things yes. here. yeah some of the things on our window we've got some cast dinosaur teeth and jaws <clears throat> these are replicas of like exact copies in not fossil material um otherwise we wouldn't just leave them sort of sitting around like that but we've also got some material here this is a little bit more of the biden skeleton that i was showing 
that we still need to clean up and process and put into the collection. So it's kind of wrapped up in tinfoil because it's not quite as heavy as some of the dinosaur fossils. So instead of using the medical bandages, the gypsonas that Derek was just showing, it's kind of wrapped up in cotton and tinfoil. So this is stuff where we will sort of carefully unwrap these and then put special glues and consolidants into it to make sure that it stays really solid and sturdy when it's going to go sit in cabinets for the rest of its life, afterlife, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is this room is really where we do we keep both the collection and we also do a lot of work on processing that collection. So the insect fossil that Derek was showing you is part of a collection of almost 18,000 fossils that came in as one single donation to the museum. So it's actually taken us almost two years just to unpack them, put them into the cabinets. Every specimen has to get a little number and enter it into our database. And then we need to sort and actually identify them. So we haven't even really hit the research part of this particular collection yet. Um, we're still in that kind of collections management and processing phase, which is super important for any museum and any research project. So yeah, so uh, in uh, sort of non-pandemic times, we would usually have volunteers sitting here painting little labels on the fossils with our little paint setup and our little like special glues in, in um, nail polish bottles <laughs> and special archival pens. Um, others would be sorting the fossils into different species, like different types of plants or different insects. Um, and then someone would be sitting at that computer cataloging and entering numbers in. So it's all, it's usually a very busy place. Here. It is usually very busy. <laughs> it's, it's very strange to not have all those <laughs> wonderful volunteers and, 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 and yeah. extra staff. So we're looking forward to them coming back eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for that. Jesse, do you think we could pop over to Q and A now? Yeah. Absolutely. There Let's might be some through. questions. Yeah, so we've had a couple more classes join us while we've been waiting too. So hi to Mr. Chantrini's class uh, and where else? Uh, Mr. Fulton's class. So we'll get to you guys in a minute for Q and A. I appreciate you guys coming in. And then for groups on YouTube, we've got Thorold, Ontario. We've got Miami, Florida. We've got some other classes. So it is a full house today. Oh, great! Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. I think the first question, which I'm going to ask on behalf of all the classes, is when you show the cast at the window. What on earth is the big tooth thing? Like, what is that from? <laughs> that was <laughs> crazy. So these are casts of tyrannosaurs. So, uh, and this particular tooth, I'm relatively certain, is a T. Rex tooth. I think so too. Um, so this is the uh, size of a tooth of a of a T. Rex. Um, it preserves in pretty good detail all of the original features of the original fossil. Um, it has it in a way that's a, a lightweight and and very hard to damage a specimen that we can use for uh, education or display or anything like that so that we can really, really show off uh, these dinosaurs. So uh, yeah, this is a, a big T. Rex tooth. This is the the edges where it would, would have the serrations. Um, so the, the um, like a, like the edges of a knife would be on the, the front and the back. And then it's got this really thick, big root on the bottom. Uh, and that's where it, it embeds into the jaw and is held in place. And, and T-Rex teeth actually, their roots are bigger than the top of the tooth. So there's more tooth in the jaw than there is exposed uh, outside of the jaw as well. So because T-Rex used its teeth um, not only to cut, but also to crush. Uh, it had very large teeth that it could, it could crush through an entire dinosaur bone as it was eating. I'm, like, I'm astonished, but I'm also so glad that they were wiped out, seeing that that's a bad <laughs> that, that uh, yeah, thing. I can appreciate that sentiment, but it does make me a little sad sometimes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> we like the Jurassic Park poster at the beginning, so we'll, we'll cover whether dinosaurs should be alive or not by the end of the broadcast. Uh, <laughs> but let's go for now to Mr. Rutledge's group in Aurelia, Ontario, grade six. Is for us. Hey, Sophie. How did humans discover dinosaurs? Yeah. How does what discover dinosaurs? How do we discover dinosaurs? Like, how do we find them in the first place? Oh, how do we find them in the first place? There's a lot of different ways that you can find dinosaur fossils. I'm going to talk about all fossils. So actually, almost anyone can find a fossil if you live in a place where fossils can be found. So it sort of depends on what rocks are exposed at the surface in the area where you live or where you want to go look for fossils. So some rocks are too old to have dinosaur fossils in them. Some rocks are too young to have dinosaur fossils in them. Dinosaurs lived for a very specific window of time. 
Uh, and some rocks just aren't the right type to contain dinosaur fossils. So if your rocks formed deep underground from cooled magma, if they're igneous rocks, that's not a great place to find fossils. But if they were laid down by ancient rivers or lakes, that's a great place to find dinosaur fossils. Um, so paleontologists like Derek and myself will usually go to places where we think we have a good chance of finding dinosaur fossils because they're the right type and the right age. And then it's very low tech. We basically walk around and look at the ground just like this. So we just have to hike around a lot and stare at the ground. And then we're usually really excited when we find a fossil because um, you're getting to see something that lived millions of years ago, maybe tens of thousands of years ago, um, possibly for the first time. But just about anyone can find a fossil if you know what to look for and if you're in the right place to look for them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we have some video um, that we could maybe share with Jesse after of, yeah. of when you last summer uh, found something. Yes, yeah, that yeah. sounds great. Any video you guys share with me, I'll put in a link to all the classes that are live and that are registered in general, so we can pass that along, and we'd love to, to share that, and uh, you guys can check that out. That's awesome, guys. Um, here in Toronto, I, I had a chance to go to a local stream recently and just break apart jail and find trilobite fossils and things. So uh, even in the heart of major cities, you can find fossils, and, and I encourage you guys to, to do that when you can. Yeah. Speaking of Toronto, I want to go to Mr. Chanfrini's class, grade six, sevens, joining us live in Toronto. If you guys have a question for us, come on up. Yeah, here. Uh, here, okay. Um, where would fossils be found? Like mountainside, underwater, or plains? And um, how many new species have you found this year? Ooh. Okay, so the first question, I just want to make sure I heard it right, was can you find fossils underwater? Did I get that right. question right? Underwater or on mountains? Like, are there specific places oh. that you find them best? Yeah. That's a, a super So, So, can you find fossils underwater on the mountains? And then, how many, how many species have we found this year? Those are the two questions. Okay, so to answer your first question, um, I don't usually look for fossils underwater, but there are definitely paleontologists who look uh, for Ice Age fossils in places like Florida or the sort of co the coastal um, states in the U.S. And they will actually snorkel and scuba dive and look for fossils that are just underwater, and they'll find things from like giant sloths or glyptodonts, these sort of arm, big giant armadillos. So I don't really do that, but that's definitely a way that you can find fossils that's really unique and interesting. Uh, in terms of finding fossils on mountains, that is something that I do because in British Columbia, most of the rocks that have uh, rocks of the right type to find dinosaurs are up on mountains. And so in order to go look there, we usually have to take helicopters. And then it becomes kind of similar to if you were looking for fossils in a desert, we'll camp on the side of the mountain and we'll hike around. And usually I get really out of breath because we're at altitude and uh, I'm not always in great shape for hiking around at 2000 meters above sea level. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it's really interesting and it's usually very beautiful. Um, the second question is how many species have we found this year? So I have not named any new species this year. I was really lucky to get to name Buster as Ferrosaurus last year. Uh, but usually there's at least like 20 to 40 new dinosaur species named per year right now. And of course, many, many more species of non-dinosaur animals. So Derek, have you named any species this year? I, I have not named not any, this year. any new species, but yeah, it's, it's really quite interesting. If you are interested in new species of dinosaurs and other fossil animals, there's usually a new species described at least every week. Um, there's some some new animal that has come out that is new to science. So we're always finding more and more, not necessarily the two of us individually, but paleontologists all over the world are always making new discoveries and we're always finding new things. Because if you think about it, then the vast amount of time represented in the fossil record, uh, and you think about the number of species around today, um, we still uh, have most of the the animals that were alive in the history of Earth are not known to science yet. So we have so much left to discover. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And there was a new species named off a specimen in our collection just yesterday, cool. an example of about a 30 million year old weird kind of shark called a chimeroid. So just a very little fossil with a couple little sort of uh, places for teeth to be in it and um, yeah named by people working off material in our collection so that's sort of the amazing important thing about museum collections is new species are discovered all the time.
Yeah, fantastic. I put on along the screen in the bottom bar uh, sort of a banner highlighting where you can learn more at the Royal BC Museum website. So I'll put that up again in a minute to check out more. But really, if you're a kid and you're interested in dinosaurs or fossils in general, there has never been a better time to get out exploring. The things coming out of China and Mongolia, North Africa now and, and around the world are just incredible. And I'll pass along resources again at the end that you can check out. Uh, but there's some really, really cool stuff. So with that, I want to go to Mr. Fulton's group in Creston, Ohio. Welcome in, guys. If you guys want to ask a question, go for it. Um, how do you determine the age of your fossil? Yeah, great question. How do you determine the age, Victoria? Oh, how do you determine the age of the fossil? So this is where it's super important to know both about animals and about rocks as a paleontologist. So we use the rocks that the fossil is found in to figure out how old, geologically old, the fossil is. Um, and we use different methods. There are some very fancy laboratory techniques called radiocarbon dating or radiometric dating, where people kind of like take the crystals out of the rocks, use special methods to figure out when those crystals formed. Um, we can use things like other fossils found in the same rocks where we know the age of them from other places, things like pollen. Um, yeah, so sometimes the very, very tiny fossils in a rock actually give you more information than the dinosaur fossils in that rock. Um, yeah, and then if we want to know the actual age of the individual animal when it died, so how old, say, Buster was when it perished and became a fossil, um, we can do things like cut up the, the limb bones and count the rings, the growth rings in those fossils. So there's sort of two answers there, one for geologic age and one for, like, the animal's age. Yeah, super cool. Thank you, Victoria. All right, uh, Ms. Eccles class joining us in Thorold, Ontario. Welcome in, guys. You've been asking this question. I want to share it. Is Buster a herbivore or a carnivore? Hello. Oh, the question I didn't tell you. Buster is a herbivore. It has a parrot-like beak that's very sharp, but then in its mouth it would have had sort of flat, almost molar-like teeth for grinding up tough plant material. Nice. Awesome. All right. Let's, that was a rapid fire one. So let's take a few more <laughs> really quick and we'll go back through all the other uh, live classes. So Mr. Hancock's group in Georgetown, Ontario, they're looking for a scandal here. Have you ever broken or damaged a fossil while you've been removing it? <laughs> uh, yep. I have done that. Derek, have you ever done that? Well, I was going to do a close up on your face to oh. see if you were lying, but <laughs> you're going to admit to it, Derek. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, there's, there's a saying in, in, among paleontologists that you you really haven't become a true paleontologist until you've broken a fossil but that's why we use a lot of uh our glues um because the important thing is if you break a fossil that you have to put it back together again yes. and so uh because the, the fossils are very fragile um breaks happen all the time they're 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 not good. You try to avoid that whenever possible. And we always want to make sure that our fossils are properly supported and protected. But if one does break, we're very prepared. Uh, and we make sure that we have the glues to glue them back together. Yeah, great question, guys. Um, all right, I'm going to go to Mr. Close class, uh, also in Georgetown. Way to go, Georgetown. Nice to have like half the town in today. I love this question. What is the craziest object you've ever seen fossilized? Craziest thing. Blew your mind. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Thing I ever saw fossilized? What an interesting question. Um, that's a great question. I don't know how to answer that. I guess so for me, one of the funniest things that can fossilize is poop. So I guess that's kind of a funny one. So you can actually get fossilized dinosaur dung. We have a very fancy name for it called a coprolite. Um, and that's just sort of like the fancy way of saying fossilized feces. Uh, so I think that's always a little bit funny when you first learn about that. Um, I'm trying to think about some interesting things. I find a lot of dinosaur footprints and trackways can be very surprising because they can record information you wouldn't get just from bones themselves. So you might see where a dinosaur slipped on mud, or you might see where they sat down and left bum prints, which I think is very funny. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's always such interesting, surprising things. Derek, what's yeah. the, what's the weirdest thing that you've found? Um, in terms of Things that I've found, uh, I would say that probably the, the weirdest thing would be some of the, the strangest uh, dinosaurs that we've collected. There's some very strange dinosaurs. I was uh, part of an expedition uh, when I was uh, doing my master's degree uh, in Mongolia, where we were able to uncover um, a a skeleton of an animal called Dinochirus, which was very strange. Uh, Dinochirus means terrible hands because for the longest time it was just known from these 
big hands, really long arms, six foot long arms. Uh, and we didn't know what it belonged to until uh, the team I was a part of found a skeleton of it. And we discovered that it was actually a type of ostrich mimic dinosaur, an ornithomimid uh, dinosaur uh, that was the size of T-Rex, basically, um, with these gigantic arms and very, very strange look. It has a weird sort of big, long skull. It was probably a plant eater. It's, it's back bones have these weird tall spines in them so it almost looks like a suspension bridge um the, with the the backbone of the animal so it's very very weird that's probably the weirdest thing that i've found myself okay i'm going to try and find a dino Kyrus picture that we can share at the end of the broadcast too they are super cool i put up their name on the on the broadcast you can check that out uh one thing i wanted to share too i have it as the backdrop for today's session uh so uh, Victoria hasn't even mentioned this yet, her obsession with ankylosaurs and how cool they are. So I wanted to show you guys Borealopulpa in the background. So I'm going to show you one of the coolest fossils found in the last few years. Uh, so just check this out. And that is just one of the most beautiful fossils I think ever discovered. It's stunning. We'll share that at the end too. Um, yeah, this is great, guys. Let's dive back in with our live classes. We'll go back to Regent Park. Uh, so Mr. Rutledge's class, if you guys have any questions for us, come on up. Yes, we do. Ava will ask a question. What is the biggest fossil that you found yet? Ooh, the biggest fossil that you found. Ooh, the, the biggest fossil I found. What's the biggest fossil I found? That's a great question. I've been part of so many teams of people digging up bone beds of dinosaurs. So it's not necessarily that I found the whole bone bed, but I'll uncover individual bones in there. And yeah, dinosaur bones get really big, really fast. A big limb bone, a thigh bone or a femur from like a duckbill dinosaur is pretty big. Usually takes a couple of people to carry out. Um, I used to work at a site similar to Derek where we would dig up a dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus. And they have a big blob of bone on their nose and that makes their skulls really big and really heavy to carry out. I'm trying to think about the biggest thing I've ever found. Those almost any dinosaur bone other than Buster becomes really big really quickly. So yeah, they they just get big very fast. What about you, Derek? Have you what's the biggest one you excavated? I've I've worked on a, uh, a triceratops skeleton mm. uh, in in South Dakota. Uh, and the Triceratops, so we've worked on a lot of different horned dinosaurs. There's lots of different horned dinosaurs. There's small ones like Buster. Um, there's relatively large uh, dinosaurs like Pachyrhinosaurus, which is sort of the size of like a, a bison or something like that, or perhaps a rhino. Um, but Triceratops is the biggest of the horned dinosaurs, and you really aren't really prepared for how big it is when you start digging. It's so big. And I remember distinctly digging up the shoulder blade of uh, the Triceratops and and I was exposing it. And, you know, I, I had about this much of it. Uh, the, the It's sort of a, a large sort of um, uh, plank looking bone. So it's like a long bone, but it's pretty narrow or usually pretty narrow. And I was exposing the width of it and I exposed this much and I was like, oh, this must be almost the end of it. And I exposed more and more and more and I just kept going. And the 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 width of it is about like, like this. So it's about that thick across and then over a meter in length. Uh, it's just this gigantic bone. And it's like, this is just one bone of this giant dinosaur. Um, so yeah, Triceratops is definitely up there for the biggest things I've worked on. Um, I love the passion. You guys are so enthusiastic. It's awesome. Uh, let's head back to Mr. Chanfrini's class. If you have another question for us, come on. Yeah, we have another question. <laughs> Don't be disappointed. We'll take more later. We'll make more later. Oh, what, what is the rarest? Oh, 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 my bad. What's the rarest um, fossil that you have in your collection? The what fossil? What was it? Come back, come back, come back. You said what kind of fossil? The what kind of fossil? What's, what's the rarest fossil? Rarest. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so the rarest fossil you have in your collection, Victoria? Ooh, the rarest fossil we have in our collection. So Buster is a good example of a very rare fossil because it's the only one of its species that we know of in the whole world, and it's wow. in our collection. That's actually pretty common for a lot of dinosaurs. A lot of dinosaurs are only known from one specimen. 
um, for their whole species. We're really excited when we get like more than one. So that's always great because then we can learn about how they varied among different individuals. Um, we have some really interesting fossils in our collection. We actually have some fossil pearls from the Cretaceous period. So that's pretty neat. I've never seen anything like that anywhere else. So basically there were um, these sort of like 70, 75 million year old clams. And when they broke open, there was a pearl inside them. So that's pretty rare. Um, we have some examples of fossil flowers. Flowers are pretty rare in a lot of collections. That's part of this Maccabee collection. Flowers are so delicate, it's really hard to get them to preserve. Um, what else do we have? I mean, there's so many, I could just go on and on, but I think Buster is a good example and pearls are a really good example. Yeah, perfect. The interesting thing about fossils is that each fossil is individually unique. Uh, you're, you're never going to replace it again, exactly like that. So even if you have a very common fossil, say uh, like petrified wood, it's an example of a common fossil. Each individual piece of that petrified wood uh, is completely unique and is irreplaceable. Fantastic, guys. Thanks so much. Um, all right, we got some buster lovers on YouTube, so I want to take a few questions from there. Uh, so, from Holly, uh, Ms. Eccles Group, what family of dinosaurs does buster belong to? Yeah, buster belongs to this family of dinosaurs called the Leptoceratopsids, which I know is a bit of a tongue twister, but they're part of the bigger group of dinosaurs called Ceratopsia, the horned dinosaurs. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Victoria. All right. And then Miss Places class joining us all the way in Miami, which is about as far as you can get in North America from you guys right now. Um, mm -hmm. close there. Uh, so was Buster covered with fur or feathers? And were the fossils you were holding of Buster casts or real? Ah, so the fossils that I was holding were the real original fossils. Uh, we actually haven't made a cast of Buster yet because we just haven't gotten around to doing it. It actually takes a long time to make them. You have to be very careful so you don't wreck the fossils originally. So yeah, those were the original 67 million year old bones I was holding in my hands. And Buster, we don't really know 100% for sure what exactly Buster looked like while it was alive. Um, some of the illustrations that I use show it having little quills on its tail. Uh, it probably was mostly scaly, but we really don't know. We, we keep finding f dinosaurs with fuzz and feathers and fluff when we sort of don't expect it. So, yeah, I'm, and, and we basically just don't have any examples of skin impressions for leptoceratopsids. So it really could go either way. But probably the best guess is that it's mostly scaly. Yeah. A quick follow up on this. So we know now that a lot of dinosaurs did have feathers, the, the preventators of birds. Birds are in fact dinosaurs. But fur, as I mentioned, to my knowledge, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, fur is something that was not the dinosaur lineage entirely. Like this is a separate group of reptiles that led to us. Yes? Yeah, that's right. So fur is uh, unique to mammals. So fur and like sweat glands, those are mammal characteristics. But a lot of early dinosaurs had feathers that were basically just one filament. So very hair-like. Uh -huh. um, it, they're kind of different because the material that they're made of is a little bit different. So in mammals, our skin and our fur is made of a type of keratin called alpha keratin. Uh, and it has a little bit of a different chemical and physical structure. And then bird fluff and feathers is made out of something called beta keratin. So again, a slightly different type of this sort of chemical compound that makes up our skin and fur and fingernails and all of that good stuff. Um, but yeah, so a lot of a lot of early dinosaurs would have probably looked furry, but they were actually just very simple feathers, kind of like the down on a chick. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for the clarification. All right, we're going to go over one last question back to Norway Middle School. So Ohio, if you guys have another question for us, come on up. Anybody? I don't think we have a question. Nope, okay, that's all good. Well, I'll go back to our other classes. So Mr. Chantini, I know you had a student that was really disappointed in the front row. <laughs> so if you have a question, go for it, man. Where would you be able to find? <laughs> Where would you be able to find like amber? Can you repeat that one more time? Where would you be able to find things like amber? Oh, oh where can we find things like amber? So amber is fossilized tree sap, uh, and it's really cool because sometimes it can contain insects or feathers, anything that sort of might have gotten stuck to that sticky sap on a tree can be preserved in amber. It's usually preserved really well in three dimensions and it looks really cool. We actually do have some amber in our collection here from the Maccabee fossil bed site. It's about 50 million years old. Um, and I know Derek uh, has seen some cool amber examples from Alberta as well. Yes, yeah, so uh, basically uh, like any dinosaur fossil, you can find amber um, in 
any place that has the right age rocks. If you're looking for amber that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, sometimes you can find amber uh, near where you find dinosaur fossils. It just so happens that if you have a, a tree that gets damaged in some way, it will start exuding this sap. So it sort of squirts out the, the sap that then gets uh, on the surface of the tree. And then different things can get stuck into the sap. And then once that sap, if the, the tree dies or something and gets buried, that sap then, then gets incorporated into the fossil record. So you find them in the same sorts of places that you find all the other fossils. You have to know where to look for sedimentary rocks and of the right age. Um, but you can find them um, in all of all the places you find dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome, guys. One thing I, I love about Amber, and this was sort of made apparent to me the other day, is that all throughout the solar system, all throughout the galaxy and the universe, you can probably find some of the other gemstones that we love and, and cherish on Earth. Uh, just the chemical processes, the, the way the you know rocks move, we can get those things. But Amber is almost certainly unique to Earth. I mean, it comes from a living thing. It's such a cool thing. Um, and so that's just, a, I think, a neat way of looking at it. That's a really good point. I think one of my favorite, I just remembered as Derek was talking that I bet this is probably Derek's favorite amber specimen as well. We both went to school at the University of Alberta. And while we were there, someone discovered a hadrosaur, a duckbill dinosaur jawbone. And there was a huge piece of amber stuck to where the teeth used to be. So it wasn't that the dinosaur died chewing on a piece of amber. It just kind of blopped on there after the, the sort of all the meat and everything was already gone from the bone. But it it's probably the biggest piece of amber I'd ever seen. Most amber is very, very small in our collection. It's usually very small, um, but this was a pretty cool, a pretty cool fossil at the University of Alberta. I really liked it. Yeah, super cool, guys. So before we wrap up, amazingly, we're almost at the end of the broadcast. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, I just wanted to take the chance to highlight a project of our own we're doing all September long. I think some of our classes are already part of this. Uh, but all September, Backyard Bio, we're encouraging classes to get out, explore the local wildlife near them, share pictures of what they find on Twitter, with hashtag Backyard Bio, on iNaturalist, and more. We'd love to see what you guys can share. Ten days to go, lots of cool resources to take part. So do check that out if you get a chance. Uh, and with that, I just want to turn it back to Victoria and Derek. Is there any last thing you'd like to share with us about your own collections, uh, dinosaurs in general, anything you can highlight with you? Oh, what any cool things. I think I just want to highlight how important museum collections are, not just for dinosaurs, but for all kinds of natural history objects, bugs, plants, mammals. Um, it's a super important, it's like a library and a record of life on Earth that lets us study it over and over and over again. So museums are super important, even though you might not get to see all of the backstage areas like you did today. Um, most museums have big collections like this, and we really do use them to learn new things all the time. Um, so yeah, so that's going to be my like closing thoughts about the paleontology collection here at the Royal BC Museum. What about you, Darren? Uh, yeah, so uh, I would definitely agree with with uh, all of that. The, the collections are, are so important uh, to a museum, and and so important that uh, all of these fossils that uh, we protect them for the future because they're, as I said, very unique. Uh, and you will never find the, the same fossil twice. And so preserving that and making sure that we have those specimens so that we can do paleontology science to learn about our past is very important um, for the future. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you guys so, so much. It's been such a thrill getting to highlight uh, your enthusiasm, such amazing collections and more. And what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to demute the microphones of Regent Park. I'm Mr. Chanfini's class too. And so students, if you guys could join me in saying a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.